Stand with me, please, for the reading of his word. Psalm 24 says, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? He's the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Blessed be the Lord, for he has made marvelous his loving kindness to me in a besieged city. As for me, I said in my alarm, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you have heard the voice of my supplications when I cried to you. Oh, love the Lord. All of you, his godly ones, 
The Lord preserves the faithful and fully, fully recompenses the proud doer. Be strong and let your heart take courage. All of you who hope in the Lord. Let's thank him for his love this morning, church. What wondrous love is this, O oh, my soul, O oh, my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh, my soul? What wondrous love is this that calls the Lord of bliss? To bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul. To bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down. When I was sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down beneath God's righteous crown, Christ, he laid aside his crown for my soul. Thank you, Lord, for my soul. Christ, he laid aside his crown for my soul. To God and to the Lamb, I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb, I will sing. Sealed my 
life hardened with his blood hallelujah what a savior guilty vile and helpless we spotless lamb of god was he full atonement can it be hallelujah what a Thank you, thank you. Would all the rest of you vile sinners please stand with these that have just sung? And that's what they said in that song, amen? Yeah, well, that's us. And I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Revelation as we begin this morning. And for the next 10 weeks, I'm going to be preaching in this first chapter of the Revelation. That word meaning coming from that word apocalypsis, where we get our word apocalypse from it. Now, most of us think of apocalypse, we think of chaos, calamity, and some people are fearful of this book. Dear friend, this book is a revealing of our Lord. It reminds me when people speak of being scared of this book of the gentleman in the cab who wanted to ask the cab driver something and reached up and touched him on the shoulder and the cab driver screamed and jumped and jerked the wheel, ran across four lanes of traffic in front of a bread truck, almost got killed and came to land in a ditch on the other side. And the guy said, I'm sorry. He said, no, it's not your fault. No, no problem. Uh, just today's my first day to drive a cab. And for the last 20 years, I've been driving a hearse. And I, I just <laughs> was a little fearful of what was going on. Well, don't, don't, get, don't get frightened of this book, all right? You don't have to get scared. There's good news, good news. 
is in this book. Matter of fact, verse 3 says, if you hear it and heed it, the blessing of God will come on you. So I challenge you, as I did last Sunday morning while I was away, I, I read through the first chapter seven times out of seven different translations in my quiet time. But I'd encourage you just to be reading. It's just 20 verses. But boy, is it power-packed and, and just filled with great truth that we need to see. And so the next several weeks, I'll be looking in this chapter. And I want to begin this morning with a message I simply entitled out of that first line, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John. We'll look at John next week, the last man standing who testified to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Here's the promise. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, we'll talk about that in four weeks, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits, in six weeks we'll talk about the seven spirits of God, who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, and to him be glory and the dominion forever and ever. And say that word with me. Amen. To him be glory. This book, the revelation, means in our word an unveiling, a revealing. Now, I want to give you one thing, and I never want you to say it wrong again. This is not the book of revelations. There is not an S on the end of it. And if you ever say it, with an S on the end of it, you owe God 20% that week. <laughs> it is the revelation, one revelation of our one Savior from one God. Now, there are many things in the book, and we see many things, but the revelation is singular. It is one, and it only reveals one thing. It reveals Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's what it's about. It is not a book that is to conceal Jesus. It is a book that reveals Jesus, the revelation of Jesus Christ. As you, his bondservant, you're seated. I want to show you the first description of Jesus in the Apocalypse, in the Revelation. Jesus is described three times in this first chapter. And this morning, I want to show you simply two things out of verses 5 and 6 where we find who Jesus is and what Jesus did and what he does. So let's dive right in, and I want you to see these things this morning. Number one, who is Jesus? Who he is? It's found in verse number 5. It says it when it's from Jesus Christ. Here it is. There are three truths about who he is. The faithful witness, firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Jesus is number one, truth. He is the faithful witness. You ever been called to be a witness? They'll call you to a courtroom, and the judge will have you stand. A bailiff will be there. They usually put a book, a Bible there. You put your hand on the Bible, put your other hand up, and they ask you if you will pledge to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, and then normally they will say, so help you God. Well, Jesus is the truth. He is nothing but the truth, but he did not have to say so help him God because he is God. He is the faithful witness, and he gives the truth every time he speaks. In John's Gospel, chapter 18, and verse number 37, when Jesus was called to be a witness before Pilate, Jesus said this to Pilate. He said, I have come to testify or to witness to the truth. Jesus came for one reason, and that was to give us truth. We live in America 
in a day of evangelical disaster. The disaster in the church is the accommodation of truth. We have moved away from truth. When I say the year 1929, most of you who know your history, and especially all of my high schoolers know it, you would say that was the year of the Great Depression in America. And indeed it was when Wall Street fell and the stock market fell and the Great Depression came. But that was not the key event of 1929. It stuck in our mind because it had to do with money, and money is king. It is God. It is Lord in America. But also in 1929, a man was fired. He was a pastor. He was a very conservative Bible preacher. He taught at Princeton Theological Seminary. At that time, a bastion of theological conservatism. And Dr. Gershom Machen, that old Presbyterian preacher, was defrocked. He was voted out. And he left Princeton and he founded Westminster Seminary. And it was on the front page of every paper in America that this conservative, Bible preaching preacher had been fired and had gone out from that seminary that had started leaning to the left. Why did they fire him? You look back across the ocean to Germany and higher criticism started when people began to say, I know more than the Bible. And man ruled over the Bible rather than the Bible ruling over man. And when man rules over the Bible rather than the Bible ruling over man, and we become critical of the Bible rather than the Bible becoming critical of us, we have a mess on our hands theologically. And that's exactly what happened in 1929 in America. And then the pulpits of the land in our major denominations began to be filled with young men that had gone to the seminary where they were critical of the Bible and Presbyterians and Baptists and Methodists and Church of Christ and all the Episcopalians and others began to go into their pulpits and preach. And then from 29 and 30 and 35, all of this began to filter. Do you understand? If you come sit here 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, Crawford, how long have you and Elizabeth been in this church? Since 1980. That's 32 years. If he sits here and listens to me for 32 years and Brother Jerry in that time, that gets in your mind and your spirit. Now just multiply that with every church in Pensacola with leaders sitting in there and young people sitting there, and this truth begins to filter down and filter down and filter down, and it goes out and it goes out. It goes to Baptist Hospital. It goes to Guff Power. It goes to where people are working. It goes into the school boards. It, it goes into the county commissioners and men are thinking, and, and that truth comes, and, and it comes. And if there is a high view of Scripture that's being lifted up, the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, then that is in you. But when you're critical of the Bible, that comes out, and you become not God-centered, but man-centered when you go sell electrical supply, when you began to do uh, work at the Baptist Hospital, when you began to do work in the school board, wherever you go to do it, then, then you find that you're one of those two things. And what happened in America in 1929 is that we said we're going to put God to the side and raise man, and man was raised in the pulpits and it began to filter down and filter down and filter down and what we have in America today is what I call the happiness and freedom movement just make everybody happy and everybody free what's your goal in life I just want to be happy pastor that's a bad goal God didn't call you to be happy he called you to be holy and if you get holy you'll be happy but you can be happy and not be holy. And then there's this great freedom movement. We just want to be free. Here's what's happened in America. We've, we've so come to freedom that we have freed ourselves from any encumbrance. That there'll be no truth. There'll be no Bible looking down on me. No God, I just, I'm free. Bless God, I do whatever I want to. 
Who would have dreamed in 1930 and 1940, even into the 1950s, that this truth began to filter down, filter down, coming from pulpit after pulpit after pulpit, going to person, to mom and to daddy and to granddaddy and grandmother and grandchild, and it filters down and filters down and filters down and filters down until the 60s came. And who would have believed that in America we would then have expelled God from public school? Uh, who would have said the Bible no longer has a place? And who would have said we can't pray in, in that place? Who would have ever dreamed that in 1960? I wouldn't. Now, when I went to school, we read a story from the Bible every morning. It said the Pledge of Allegiance talked about one nation under God. Who would have dreamed that we would come to the place that we're in today? Do you see in our public schools, you still get a good education when it comes to English and mathematics and part of the sciences, but God's been kicked out of the science lab. There's no creationism. They may talk about it, but I'm just here to tell you, friend, if you preach that, they'll fire you. You see, God's been expelled in those places. Who would have dreamed that we would come to? Who would have dreamed? In 1960, that America would now be killing millions, millions of babies in the womb and doing it all under the flag of a woman's choice. What about the baby's choice? He or she doesn't get to choose. And now, the Philadelphia butcher is on trial in Pennsylvania this week. It started in March and the trial goes on. Who is he? When you read the court case of Dr. Kermit Gosnell, if you can call him a doctor, babies that were trying to be aborted were live born in his clinic. And he took scissors and snapped the spine of eight children. And he now is on trial for murder, as well he should be. But tell me, why is it that 20 children can be killed and gunned down in Connecticut, and it's on the front page of every paper, it's in every state house, it's in every white house, it's in every house. And people are screaming and carrying on. But when there's eight unborn children murdered in an abortion clinic, tell me why you've not heard about that story. I'm going to tell you why. It's because America has voted a law in that makes it legal to kill those children inside the womb. But once they exit the womb, oh, we don't know. And we are embarrassed. We are guilty. And we've just simply put God... Everybody knows when life begins. Why? You don't have to look far to see that little baboon. 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 They put that grease on that woman's stomach. They run that little sensor across there. And I said, there it is. What is that? I don't know, just a blob or something. Say, so you come back next time, I'll tell you if it's a female blob or a Male blob. You see what's happened. Humanism, man centeredness is so drifted down now into our medical society that we won't even call it murder when a doctor cuts the spine of the most innocent among us. Who would have dreamed? Who would have dreamed that television and the movie houses would have such perversion that 1960 would have never got out of the back room, the cutting room floor of a film, and now you find it on major networks? Who would have dreamed that America would become so arrogant that we would take to our courts a country less than 300 years old that we would say to the rest of human history, you had it wrong. Marriage is not just between a man and a woman. It can be between a man and a man. And we're going to redefine in our humanistic thought process what marriage is. 
no matter what the world has said for generation after generation, nation after nation, society after society, culture after culture, we know better than the world. I want to ask you this question. When it becomes legal for a man to marry a man in every state in the Union, then why cannot a transsexual marry both a man and a woman? If I can marry another man, why can I not marry two? I could go on from there with that slippery slope. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see where we're going to go there the same way we've done in the abortion clinic to the place where killed children are killed in the very hospital where they should be the safest of all. Where did all that come from? Why did America change? I'm going to tell you where it changed. It changed right here. In 1929, America changed when we began to put our mind over this book rather than this book over our mind. Jesus Christ said, I am the faithful witness. I am truth. It may not happen in my day. It'll happen in Robert's day. We're not that far apart, but he's coming behind me in a generation. I'm here to tell you the day will come Unless we have Holy Ghost, heaven sent revival in this land. And the first thing they'll do is they'll come to Olive Baptist Church and say, you sit on 51 acres of ground and you will begin to pay property tax on that, on that property if you will not allow a man and a man to get married in this building. That's the first thing they'll go. Next thing they'll go is when Zach becomes a pastor, they'll put him in jail. Why? Because it's hate speech. You read Romans chapter 1. Dear friend, I'm telling you, when we begin to lift up the truth, you lift up Jesus and he's promised he'll never leave you, never forsake you, and he will draw men, women, boys, and girls unto himself. He is the faithful witness. Secondly, he says in here, not only is he truth, secondly, he is triumphant. He is triumphant. Notice, the Bible says that he is the firstborn from the dead. Amen. He's the first one ever resurrected. He's the first one with a resurrected body. He's the firstborn, the Bible says, of all creation. The Bible goes on to say that Jesus is to have first place preeminence in every life. You know who's supposed to be first in your life? Not your wife. You know who ought to be first in your life? Not your husband. You know who ought to be first in your life? Not your grandchildren. Well, maybe your grandchildren. No, no, I'm just telling you, not your grandchildren. Jesus is the preeminent one. He should be first place. He's the firstborn from the dead, and he ought to be first place in your life because he is the triumphant Savior of all the world. He's the truth. He's the triumphant one. Thirdly, he is the title holder. Yes, notice what it said right here in this text. Not only is he the faithful witness, firstborn of the dead, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. John is being persecuted. John is on Patmos. Patmos is just a small island. It's off the coast of present-day Turkey, right across from uh, ancient Egypt, uh, 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 Ephesus. And I've been to that island. You go up there and you walk up steps, steps, and way high on this old rock island. You go up to a Catholic monastery on the top. The Isle of Patmos. Why was John there? Let me tell you why John was there. It's because Domitian had put him there. You see, Nero was the emperor of Rome. He died in 68. You remember Nero? He's the one that fiddled while what? Rome burnt. He didn't literally fiddle, but he fiddled around, all right? He wasn't a fiddler. But after Rome burned, he blamed it on the Christians, and then he burnt Christians at the stake. He lined the Apian way with Christians. He put tar on them and he put them on a post and he'd make them like lamps going down the Apian way. He died in 68. Then Domitian became emperor. That's how John got in trouble. Domitian lived until 96 and history says he bathed the world in Christian blood. And Domitian called himself God and Lord. And every time he signed a document passing a law in Rome, he signed it this way, quote, Our God and Lord Domitian directs and commands whatever it be. Our God and Lord Domitian directs that the roads be paved. Our God and Lord Domitian directs and commands that taxes be X, Y, Z. And Domitian called himself 
God and Lord. And when John came along, he started preaching the gospel, and he said, there is one named Jesus, a poor carpenter from Nazareth, and he is both Lord and God. And Domitian didn't like it. That's how John wound up on Patmos. Lord Domitian died in 96. If you come next Sunday, I'll tell you what happened to John. He went back and pastored. He went back to Ephesus. I'd like to heard that old bird when he is 97 preaching the gospel. Domitian, I got a word for you as you burn in hell. I can just hear John. <laughs> well, he didn't care. Why, he is preaching the gospel of the title holder. He is the king. Above every king. And the Bible says that every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess, your knee, my knee, your tongue, my tongue, that Jesus is the Lord. Did you hear the choir? They were singing, who is, they ask a question, who is the king of glory? Who is the king of glory? I'm asking you, who is the king of glory? If you don't know the answer, the answer is the Lord. Mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. Who is Jesus? He is truth, he is triumphant, and he is the title holder of this world. Secondly and quickly, what does Jesus do? Three things are outlined for us right here in verse number five and six. He loves us, he released us, and he made us. Look at number one, he loves us. Do you know God loves you? You know Jesus loved you. How, why in the world would Jesus love some of y'all? I mean, look around at this crowd. Why in the world would Jesus love some of y'all? He's like he's lost his mind. Aren't you glad Jesus loves us? Say amen. amen. Man, you can't get so far from God that, that he doesn't love you and reach and save you to the uttermost. He loves us. Dear friend, I don't know who you are, what you've done. I don't care who you are, what you've done. I want you to know the arm of Jesus. The Bible says in Isaiah is not short and it cannot reach and save the other most. I don't care how deep you go into the pit. I'm telling you, he can reach into the muck and mire and pull you out. He loves us. Secondly, the Bible says he releases us. Uh, look at it right here. And, and he has released us from our sin. You see, sin is a captor. Sin leads us to captivity. It, it, when we get in the captivity of sin, then Guilt is the chain, and it wraps itself around us, and we need to be released from our sin. Last week, I was home and took a few days off, and Liz came in, and she said, I want to watch that movie. I said, which one? She said, that one about Lincoln. Is it on the TV thing? I don't want to go to the old theater. I just want to watch it on television. I said, all right. So I finally called my son and figured out how to work it, and, um, <laughs> and we got Lincoln. I don't know if it was factually, everything factually true, but there was two hours of Lincoln's life working toward the Emancipation Proclamation. He wanted to be the emancipator to the slaves. They wanted America to do it, and he led the charge. And finally, Lincoln won the vote, and he won the day. The slaves were emancipated when they signed the bill with the ink. And I want you to know, friend, when you go back 2,000 years to a place called Calvary, Jesus became the emancipator, and he set you free from your sin, and he signed the contract with his own blood. You remember that song on Easter Sunday they did? They were singing about the blood, and I didn't know the first part of it, and I was just kind of humming along. And then they got to the part where they interjected that old hymn in there, and they began to sing. What? Can wash away my sin. What can make me whole again? Oh, yeah, and they'd sing, they'd say, Nothing, nothing. I'm telling you, friend, there is nothing that can set you free save the blood, the blood, the blood of the Lord Jesus. He has loved us and He has released us from our sin. But now, thirdly, thirdly, come on, Lord, just let it thunder and rain. I'm not done yet. I, I don't want to go home. There's a third thing. And as He loves us, not only does He release us from our sin, the Bible says He made us. 
Now, after he saves you, he does something in you, and he makes you two things. Number one, he makes you a monarchy, and he makes you a priesthood. Now, I want you to look at this. It's found right here in this text. Look at it in verse number six. And he has made us to be a kingdom priest to his God and Father. When I got saved, I joined the monarchy. Amen. I'm part of the kingdom. You got saved, you're part of the kingdom. Now, I am a saved American. You can be an American without being saved. Some people don't believe that. Just because you're born in America doesn't make you a Christian. If you was born in a garage, that doesn't make you a car, all right? If you was born in America, that doesn't make you a Christian. You got to be born again. But, but I'm an American that is saved, and when I, I became an American citizen, then I joined a democratic process in an American republic. But I am a part of a monarchy. You say, well, what's that mean? Now watch this. I'm a part of a democracy in America because I vote on stuff. I vote every time. Even if I don't know, I guess. I try to do my homework. When I go, I check every box. I participate in the democratic process. But I do not live in a democracy. I live in a republic. It has democratic principles because we elect our officials and you ought to vote and be involved. And I'm telling you, when you have men and women that are on the ballot and they live contrary to this book, you ought not ever vote for them. You ought to turn your back on them and you ought to stay away from them. I'm just telling you, that's what you ought to do. And when you find people that are running in the wrong direction, remember, you're not a part of this democracy. You're a part of the monarchy. And he is the king, and you are his subject, and you are more subject to God than you are to America. But now on the other side, I'm not always too keen on my republic. Because a republic is ruled not by what men vote on. It is by the Constitution of the states and of the United States. And I get in the democratic process and I'm a part. But I don't belong there. I'm part of the monarchy. I'm in America. I'm part of the republic, but I don't live there. Because sometimes they put stuff in that Constitution that is contrary to the Word of God. Everybody tells me they're about to put in our Constitution a man can marry a man. They may do that. But I want you to know right now, they'll never a man marry a man at this altar. And there'll not be anybody stand here and do a wedding like that. It will not happen. Why? Because I, I'm not a part of the republic first. I'm a part of the monarchy first, and he's the king. I'm his subject. And if that costs me my job, or if it costs us our tax status, or if it costs us jail time, it'll be time to stand for the living Lord God and his word. Now, that doesn't make us just against stuff, but I'm telling you, there is some stuff you got to be against because if you're for him, when the people vote or the politicians then begin to construct a constitution, and when those run full in the face of the teaching of the King of Kings, you've got to choose. For instance, he chose you and saved you. There's no choice to be made. That choice has already been made. And you begin to stand. For, he makes us a monarchy because he's the king and we're his subjects. But secondly, he makes us a priesthood. I'm a priest. You say, well, preacher, I know. No, no, no. See, we, we've so perverted. Now, when you preach the Bible, you'll get in the way of people. I met somebody out there this morning. They shook my hand and said, Pastor, how you doing? I said, I think I got in trouble at 9.30. Well, I thank God that, that, uh, that church member said, that's all right, Pastor, that's your house. You, you do what you want to in there. I said, well, all right, I believe I'll just help myself. I'm a priest. He said, well, Pastor, if you're a priest, does that mean you put on a, a clerical collar? No, 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 the priesthood has nothing to do with putting on your collar. It has everything to do with taking up your cross. It's, it's not on the outside. It's on the inside. 
You see, everybody in this room, it saves a priest. You're a priest before God. You're part of the monarchy. He's the king. You're a subject. But then he says he's made us a part of the priesthood. What's that mean? It means three things. Number one, as a priest, you have a direct access to God. You, you can talk straight to the Father. You don't need anybody else to help you. You go right to the Lord. Number two, a priest not only has access, a priest makes sacrifices. Like the Old Testament priest brought the sacrifices, the lamb, the goat, the bullock. But the sacrificial system has changed now. The Bible says we bring the fruit of our lips, according to Hebrews 13, as a sacrifice of praise. The book of Romans says that we bring our bodies a living sacrifice. And we give our praise. That's why everybody ought to sing every Sunday. So preacher, I don't sing very well. Neither did I. You heard me. I'm not singing for you. I'm singing under him. We're going to get to glory and Leo's going to look at me and say, my, my, where was that voice in heaven? He said, that's my pastor. I said, remember now, there's no envy here. This is a perfect place. <laughs> there's a sacrifice of praise. You don't just have to sing it. You can say it. Matter of fact, when you read the word of God, angels never sing. You never find an angel singing. They're praising, but they never sing. They give glory, they give honor, but they don't sing. He reserves that for us. To save, to sing, to give praise, and to give our body. As a priest, we have access. As a priest, we bring a sacrifice. And thirdly, as a priest, we represent God in the world. I'll never forget it. Vacation Bible School. 1971, Pisgah Baptist Church, Mrs. Bearden was teaching the class and I was the helper. I was a senior, about to be a senior in high school. I was teaching the lesson and a little boy raised his hand and said, I I'd like to get saved today. And I thought, praise God, this is going to be good. And I got out my Bible and just as I was about to say, Miss Bearden came running over and said, what's going on? I said, the boy wants to get saved. She said, wait on, hold right there. I'll go get the preacher. I said, we don't need no preacher. I'm here. I'm a priest. I, I know the book. I don't know much, but I know enough to tell him what he needs to do. She said, you just wait right there. And she went and got our pastor, and he came back and led him to the Lord. I'm still hacked off about that. <laughs> right. now, now watch this. God puts in the front of some of you ministry that you ought to do, and you say, oh, I can't do that. Let me go get Dr. Trailer. Let me go get Dr. Gillen. Let me get Dr. Lewis. Friend, you don't need us. Just take them to the great physician. You, the priest, represents your father. I'm not your priest. I'm your pastor. I'm your under-shepherd. I'm your episcopos, episcopus. Looking over, that's my job. I look over the church. I oversee. I pastor. I lead. But bless God, you're a priest before God. And the, if we ever learn about the priesthood of the believer and, and loose the thousands of folks that are part of Olive, I'm telling you what, we can impact this place in Jesus' name. Who is he? He's the truth. He's the triumphant one. He's the title holder. I almost used the phrase top dog right there, but I knew you wouldn't like it. <laughs> What's he do? He loves us. He releases us. And he makes us a part of the kingdom and the priesthood. But it all begins with one word. It's found in verse number one. Sharon's putting verse one up on the board right now, and I want you to see it. Bond servant. Bond servant. It's in verse number one of your text that the revelation of Christ which God gave him to show us his bond servants. You become the bond slave of Christ. It comes from the Old Testament. A slave would be set free after seven years and then come back to the master and say, I want to serve you for nothing and work here. And he'd say, okay, you can. 
he'd take him to the door of his house and he'd take a very sharp instrument called it an awl. He'd take that awl and he'd put it through your ear, pierce your ear. And he'd mash that earlobe to the door. And he'd say, you are now bonded to the doorpost of the master's house. And you are my bond servant, not my slave. You're, you're not here because you have to be. You're here because you desire to be. Dear friend, when you as a Christian began to serve God, not because you feel like you're made to, but because you desire to, then the Spirit of God begins to set you free, and you become the bond servant of the Lord. Verse 3 says, everybody that hears the words of this prophecy and heeds the word or does them, God's going to bless. He that has ears to hear. I have ugly ears. How about you? Oh, my ears are not good. This ear over here is close to my head, but this ear here hangs way outside. I slept on this ear like this. My mother used to tape it to my head, but... I'd roll over and it, it grew out that way. I caught my Florida State wide right ear. It's hanging way out here. <laughs> if that offends you Seminoles, I'm sorry. That's just the way I remember it. It's, it's just hanging out here. My ears are ugly and then they get burnt up. Well, I have to keep stuff on them. I look like a leper today. I got burnt up here. I went to the dermatologist this week and she shot all that stuff on me and she hit me on top of my ears. I used to have a little place here on my lips. She has to hit, hit me with that. She looked at it and I, I said, okay, you spray, I slap. <laughs> I can't sit still. She looked at it. She said, you know, I believe we can pass this month. Pastor, you look pretty good. I said, amen. I thought you'd see it my way. <laughs> my ears just get burned up. I'm going to ask you to do something that you've never done in church before. It's going to be kind of stupid, but I'm, I'm going to ask you to do this for me because I don't want you to forget this. I want you to reach up and grab your ears, would you? You say, I'll preach that's dumb. I'll, I'll just hang on. It just, just indulge me for it. Now, listen, listen. The Bible says, he that has ears to hear, let him listen, but not just to hear, but to heed. He. See, so many people, what they do is they do it like this. But I'm here to tell you, you got ears to hear. Listen to God. He loves you. He releases you. He's going to make you. When you understand that, all of a sudden, your hands will go to the heavens and say, glory, glory, glory be unto the Father. <laughs> he is Jesus Christ the Lord, are you today his bond servant? On behalf of the pastor and church family at Olive Baptist Church, thank you for joining us in worship. Copies of today's service are available in audio and video formats. Call us toll free at 1-877-OLIVE-BC to place your order. Dr. Trailer's sermons, along with information about Olive, are also available on the internet by visiting olivebaptist.org. In times of trouble, you can know help. In times of debt, you can know kindness. And in times of pain, you can know hope. Join us this Sunday at Olive Baptist Church.